Hello, so this is our VAD panel. I'm so excited that everyone's here today. And I see that, um, so Sam is going to join us, but probably shortly. So I'm just gonna begin with our intro. Just, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and give our panelists a big thank you for being here. My name is Catherine Brillhart and I'm one of the executive producers and the director of virtual production on Ripple Effect. And I'll be moderating our VAD panel today. Um, so virtual production is creating a paradigm shift in how productions will function moving forward. And there are a variety of virtual production tools, techniques, and workflows that are driving all of this. Virtual art department, or VAD, plays a critical role in several of these workflows and is often mistaken as only a step in the pipeline and not necessarily recognized as the infrastructure for certain workflows. So in this unique panel, we'll have a conversation about the key processes that need to be considered in order for our virtual production ecosystem to continue to be successful, as well as to set context for VAD in that framework. So just to quickly introduce our panelists, um, we have Chris Ferreter on the line, he's CEO of Halon Entertainment, Phil Galler, CEO Lux Machina, Chris Switek, co-founder ICVR, uh, Sam Nicholson, CEO Stargate Studios, and Miles Perkins, head of business development for Epic Games. And uh, one thing that everyone has in common is their contribution to our project Ripple Effect. Um, okay, so to dive in, starting with Chris Ferreter from Halon, um, although LED wall workflows are only one aspect of virtual production, they're becoming very popular. Are there more steps uh, in this process that people might not realize there are before actually getting to the wall? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, LED walls are getting probably the most attention. It's the most visible aspect of uh, of virtual production. But you know, there was um, you guys know Kristen who worked on this project. She has a great saying about virtual production, and that's that if you remove virtual, it's just production. It's production with a new set of tools that, and most of those tools. Uh, revolve around real-time workflows, um, but there are a number of components, modular components that you can string together to solve any particular production problem on a virtual production, within a virtual production workflow. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that, that we're passionate about talking uh, with, with productions about is, is there is a certain amount of planning regarding, um, let's say, previs, tech viz, um, virtual art department that goes into getting uh, a successful real time uh, LED workflow. I think uh, one of the one of the things that I would like to see happen. Uh, just just around the virtual production discussion is gaining an understanding of how production management should happen within a virtual production. Uh, gaining a common lexicon. So we are all speaking the same language. We're all talking about the same things. And just a basic understanding of um, how say tech viz needs to change in order to set up for a successful LED shoot where you're targeting uh, in-camera composites. I see Sam's joining us. Sam, would you like to jump in and add a little bit to that? I'm curious about your thoughts as well um, in regards to virtual production community finding a common language in 2021. Well, uh... I think it, there's a there are an awful lot of different um, approaches to virtual production, every, everything from small to very large scale. And what, what I think what's important is that that one size does not fit all. You you have there are a lot of different combinations we can come up with. Um, so the reality is if you have a small production and a small budget, can you do virtual production? Is it, is it, is it achievable? And it is, uh, you know, I think you can rehearse on monitors and do all sorts of great things without a big old LED wall, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so 
the tools just keep getting better. And I think Epic is making it uh, more accessible every day. Uh, so it's going to get easier from here. And I think that it's going to become a, a as easy as green screen or anything else. And the, the hybrid fusions are what we're looking at with, uh, you know, collaborative editing and and now getting really creative in the space. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, this is one space that we've been using here, um, which kind of gives you an idea of, of what it looks like, but, um, it, you know, it, it's a very flexible space. So this is not a, a fixed space. So, um, sorry, I arrived late and just did the like scattering cameras around and stuff like that. But, uh, but honestly, we're, we're, we're working very close to very high res screens, very high frequency. Everybody's saying, do I, you know, I've got a high speed sequence. I want to shoot at 240 frames a second, you know, and to, to date, I don't know about you guys, but I haven't seen anybody shooting super high speed on LEDs. So there are some edges to the technology that you can fall off and get in big trouble if you don't do a little research on the front end. Yeah. Well, so what would your advice be to pr production? Uh, to prepare to work with these systems? Wow. Um, you know, get a vibe and a couple of TVs and put it on a desktop and try it out, right? Just get into the technology and get your feet wet. Uh, don't be afraid of it. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, a few years ago, we started, um, you know, before end display and all these great tools came along, we just started writing code for off axis projection saying, God, could we do this, you know? And, and uh, I think a, a, a really important part is everybody's obsessed with the tools right now of, you know, what's the resolution of your screen and what's this and what's that. The concept of virtual production is the same as it was on green screen. Um, the same in many ways as it was with Alfred Hitchcock, you know? You, you know, how do you plan your production to create the assets first and be 100% comfortable with them instead of waiting to fix it in post as, as we have all become very used to on green screen. So the producers have to change, the, the writers can write to fitting virtual production. And, and you, it actually is gonna change the fundamental uh, plan of, of production of what is created first and, and what is finished at the end. How does it, how does it marry with traditional visual effects because they're not going away yeah. and there has to be a handshake and pre-visualization has to be a handshake. So all those things tie together. Yeah. Well, so as a follow-up question to that, opening it up to the group, um, what are your thoughts on cross-training cross talent and helping individuals learn how to communicate with both production and post-visual effects? Um, Miles or Phil, would you want to start? I can certainly, uh, <laughs> I can certainly address. I'm sorry, I'm on set today, so I'm a little bit muffled, so I apologize. But um, uh, you know, I think the training aspect of this is actually the the biggest element that everyone misses. Um, you know, it's incredibly difficult to both operate on set in these types of environments, but also to understand how to interact with post production. You know, whether it's post production VFX teams, you know, final team, or um, post production editorial. And really, I think what we all, I think sort of know about this now and, and are starting to realize that really it's not, you know, we talk about pre-production and virtual production and production and post-production, really it's all production. And everyone really needs to actually, I, I think, understand how to move between all of these various sort of previously segmented um, almost disciplines, right? And I think as somebody who spends a lot of time on set, I think one of the things that helped me the most was to understand well, what is post actually doing when I'm done? Um, you know, what, hap what happens after, um, after uh, I've done my job? The people, uh, where are they taking the content? How do they interact with it? And I think for me, learning that was a huge boost to my career in, in not just the jobs that I was able to take, but in also the understanding that I had. And I think, um, I know certainly at Lux, one of the things that we are looking at is how do we, how do we do this cross training, right? How do we get post-production people comfortable on set, a place that they don't spend a lot of time and vice versa. How do we get people on set who, you know, quite frankly, many of us have had this, well, we'll fix it in post. And for many of us on set, that meant we don't have to think about it ever again. Um, I think we're, we're starting to try to break that down into, no, let's, let's make a decision now, but let's also follow that decision and the impact it has on the narrative from pre to production all the way through into post. Um, it's super important that we figure out as a community um, how to do this cross-training and 
to identify individuals in the industry who are going to excel in these types of um, areas. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of add on to that. I'm going to go back uh, a ways, like late 80s, early 90s. So, you know, back in the ILM days, bringing on like George Jablov and Doug Kay to help with the communication between the people who were um, computer graphics folks and those people who are on stage. This has been a struggle ever since the beginning. Um, and it's an ongoing struggle where you, you, there are different languages that are used to communicate basically the same thing. Um, throughout uh, kind of my career, I've seen you know, periodically where you'll bring in uh, a DP to actually start to talk about how do you actually light on stage? Like, what are the things that you do that maybe might be counterintuitive, but is actually a part of the language, the visual language that you have in filmmaking? Um, and, and, and everybody, all audience members are very, very in tuned with what that language is. So fast forward to now, what do we need to do? How can we actually bring these things together? I think my argument in this, and, and I was talking actually just recently to Dan Mandel about this very specifically is, let's start to have this kind of crossover where we are very specifically talking about what the filmmakers have to deal with on set so that so that the the small little details that they're able to communicate can carry all the way through the the project so yeah i think it needs to go both ways but i think also you know that so much can be conveyed when you see a filmmaker start to talk about you know the way they shot that scene in the good bad and the ugly i want to do that and then go to you know when you say that to some cg people they're just like I have no idea what he just said. Yet there are DPs or electricians and stuff like that that know exactly what he just said. And they already know how that they're gonna like uh, light that. So that, that I think some of that communication, bringing it back, I think to, to just the true art of filmmaking is what is so exciting to me. Bridging the gap between what is physical and what is virtual. Um, that the next five years is going to be awesome to watch this happen. Totally. Um, I'd be interested to hear from both Chris's actually a little bit about tools that they they build for filmmakers. Um, I know Chris ICDR built some custom for Ripple Effect, and I know that Halon's just been working on tools for a long time. And I'd love to share what you have to offer with everybody. Yeah, I, I think just kind of on the topic of what we were just discussing, uh, not necessarily a tool, but in terms of hardware format, I'm really excited to see uh, more widespread adoption and integration of USD between the game engine side and then also the uh, post VFX side. Because currently right now, I think that's kind of one of the biggest hurdles is, you know, you build out this beautiful scene in a game engine. And then you have to get your lighting and your materials to something uh, like Maya or another piece of post software. And oftentimes you lose a lot along the way, you lose a lot of time. And also you just have to spend time rebuilding and often the vision doesn't necessarily translate from the original way the scene was created. I mean, I would second the desire for a USD workflow. That's something that we've been uh, working on for a while. It's something that, that I, I think everybody wants to see uh, achieved um, you know, one of the things that, that I would really love to see is a standardization of the way uh, stages are built. Um, I, I know this is something that Zach brought up in the last panel. I, I've talked to Zach and Phil about this a lot. I've talked to Miles about this a lot. The standardization of, um, of everything in the virtual production space will make everything easier. One of the things that we've been working on quite a bit is standardization of how VAD assets are to be built. They need to be built in a very different way to, to be photorealistic and run in a real-time environment. Um, of course, standardization of how the screens are built informs then how standardization of VAD assets need to be built. So I think there's a big discussion that we all need to be having about, about how that's done. Definitely. Um, like maybe from here also, um, let's see. I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, especially the, this importance of 
um, well-engineered assets, their pipelines, the process, and how we standardize that process. Um, I mean, would each of you have sort maybe like an insight from a personal production experience where that could have come in handy or something to kind of connect with our viewers about how um, standardizing a piece of that bi bad pipeline maybe affected a, pro a project down the line and now you can see a better way of doing that process? I, I, I just want, I'll, I'll kind of try to answer that, okay, but I just want to say that Chris is, yeah, I mean, he's first, he's spot on. You know, yeah. someone asked about, you know, the technology and, you know, the standing problem, the things on the technology side that are going to stand in the way. I, I have to say, when I see a very well run stage, it's amazing because the technology falls by the wayside. Th that is what is super exciting. And I think we're going to see that increasingly so in the next uh, three years, where it's just going to simply be that the stuff works. Then what are we faced with? We're faced with content. Content is a different beast. That is art. You know what I mean? Let's not, let's make no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, this is, you know, you can, you can, you know, with the same team or different teams, you can give them the same assets, all of the same instruction, and they will come up with very different things. Um, and, and I think right now there's a, a little bit of a, um, a bottleneck um, in that area um, because I think creating real-time assets, are, it's just very different than this kind of linear uh, thing. And now let me be more direct. Um, <laughs> there was a situation where there was a, an environment that was built that just would not perform. It just would not perform. You go into it and you see that there was a little candle that was in the back that it was probably because someone was just like, you know, I got a day to build this candle. So I'm just going to throw everything I possibly can at this candle. And it basically just, I mean, it's something that was way in the back, like was, you could have just put on a card for that matter, but it just brent, brought the whole scene to, to its knees. So all of a sudden you're starting to challenge the way that you're building things because you're not building it just simply to camera. You're building now an environment that has to be performant, just as you would build a set. Um, that that wants to you know some be something that's receptive to being lit in these different ways, and that's kind of a different way of thinking about things. So I I, I think the challenge here is really in people being being open. I I, I always say that there's two right now, and in, in some ways there are two different groups of people. There are those that kind of are happy with the current process of what they've done, and then that that there are those people who are like the puzzle people, the people who just love coming up with and figuring out how to do something that's new and it's later, la the latest, and it's the kind of the greatest. And I think those puzzle people are probably right now just really loving what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think you, I, I really identify with that, that story about the, uh, the candle coming from the, the game dev world and, and just working in game engines. And I think it brings up a really good point about understanding the context of the scenes that you're building, um, because it is very different than building a game world where the player has control around where they move and they have control over where they aim their camera at. Um, ideally, when well, you should going into a shot, going into a shoot, know exactly where your stage is going to be placed. Uh, your shot should be previs. You should know what's going to be in frame. And your environment should be built with that in mind, where you can have your high quality photorealistic assets in the foreground, uh, right in front of where the camera is going to be. And then you can have a drop off in quality as you go into the distance and use some other tricks in order to optimize that. And most importantly, save time and money in terms of where on the virtual uh, environment you have that attention to detail, because there's no sense of building out something that's, you know, occluded by a a mountain or a wall that that nobody's going to see it's just a, a waste for everyone involved i also think um hey it's phil i i also think there's this, a lot of talk about I mean, even amongst my peers here a conversations about optimization and, and um improving that without i think necessarily looking at how or what, what are we actually doing on the day um i think what i would i would sort of point out is that we often talk about oh let's make the scene performant it's not just making assets optimized to performance. It's also making sure that the person who's going to be in the seat has the tools they need to work on 
moving that individual wall so it's not all one big mesh. Okay, we have that individual wall broken apart. It's having the conversations up front with cinematography and production design about which of the assets do we need to have you know access to? What features of a material do we need to have exposed, right? And it's it's building the assets not just to be performant but also to be accessible and quick, right? I mean, I cannot stress enough the amount of time you lose to oh, where did I put this parameter on this material? No, let's build it out, let's standardize it, let's have a conversation about what that is. And then let's make a decision about um, what's gonna be in a foliage system and what's gonna look like it's in a foliage system but isn't so that we can move those individual elements. You know, And um, I guess that's part of what I'm looking forward to in the next year is more people sort of, not just building really beautiful art, but also building re really beautiful art that is optimized but also works well on set so that on the day we have the handles we need and we can move things in a, efficient and effective manner that's non-destructive for everyone, both in post and in pre-production, you know, in VAD, making art. So that's what I think is important. Yeah, well, and so on this note too, um, you know, VAD is, it's not a totally new thing, but it's a relatively new service that maybe visualization companies or visual effects companies or different types of companies. I mean, you could be a stage operation company and maybe offer VAD services, but I think all of these would have different levels of experience that they're bringing to the project. Um, I'd love to hear your insights about that and maybe any advice for a producer or somebody who's trying to get a project off the ground, like where should we look for bad teams and how do bad teams work with visual effects teams and where does that fall in the pipeline? You know, right now, right now one of the most difficult things for producers is that there are very few organizations that can offer a complete umbrella of virtual production. You may be dealing with one company for your panels and you might be dealing with another for your content and another for post-production fixes and another for the design work on the front end or, and another for the pre-production, pre-visualization. Uh, so, it's very difficult for a producer to get their their uh, hands around that because who do you blame if something goes wrong? Because the LED guys will say, well, you know, it's the controller and the controller says, well, no, it's the Unreal Engine and the Unreal guys go, no, it's not our model, you know, it's the this thing. So uh, I do think it, it's a very complex design solution, this whole thing um, with, uh, interlocking technologies that are all changing very rapidly. And that's probably the biggest problem is that the LEDs of today are not the LEDs of tomorrow. They're, they're incredibly slow, uh, slow to update. They're, they're low frequency. Um, and and uh, the camera interface, the lighting, the, the, the lights don't sync to anything. You know, uh, the cameras don't necessarily sync all the time. And, you know, we've, we've uh, I think the problem for producers is how, who do I, how do I get a unified uh, group together? So depending on, on who you are and how you're approaching this thing, you know, how do you guarantee to the producer that it's not gonna fall through the cracks? Uh, and that you're not going to wind up shooting a bunch of stuff on set having everybody go, wow, it looks great. And then QC coming back and saying, the motion blur sucks. The, we see tearing in the video, we see more, how do we fix it? Oh, well, now you've got a million dollar rotoscoping budget because you have no alpha channel, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's, you know, there, there are things that are, you know, that we have become accustomed to in, in traditional visual effects, green screen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're taking some of those things away in, virtual production and saying, you're gonna love it when you walk off set. What if they don't love it when they walk off set? What's, what do you do? Because somebody's gonna take a hit on that. Uh, and if, it's, if you've made a bunch of promises that it's gonna look great, and you get a director that comes out there and says, I wanna shoot this scene at 120 frames a second, um, are you ready? And do you have a plan B? So I, and the producer will come to you and say, you said this would work, right? So, so I think all of us need to know and be very up and in front about what doesn't work. What are the limitations? We're all talking about how wonderful it is and it's incredible and you're so happy when you walk off set. What if you're not happy when you walk off set? 
and and you know uh, managing expectations, if you will. They hear virtual production and they're ready to throw out green screen and all post production, and that's not the case. You know, there's an awful lot of stuff that you know you go to a 12 millimeter lens on set and you're shooting off your screen. What's the plan? Right. It seems like a perfect um, opportunity to pull in a, your post visual effects producer and your visual effects supervisor in that conversation as early as mm -hmm. possible. Um, I, I would love to hear more from Chris and Halon about this and his thoughts as well. I think it's a really good point that that Sam brings up, and there's a, there's a lot of trust that needs to be built around virtual production, and 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 there's um, I, I guess the best way to put it is it is very easy to do something at a small scale that looks impressive, and it is a much more difficult feat to do something that will work at a production scale and a production pace. And um, this is going to be a challenge, especially when we look at the fact that if you are a producer or visual effects supervisor and you're on a film, you, you're, you're, uh, you're in one pipeline and, and you may be in that pipeline for 18 months. And from the time you start that film to the time you finish that film, technology has completely changed. The, the world of filmmaking has completely changed. And so there's, there's this constant educational process that I think needs to happen for people to understand how to use these tools properly. And, and uh, you know, we're big proponents of virtual production, but um, one fear that we have is that a lack of education leads to bad experiences, leads to some um, uh, a misapplication of these tools. And, and that brings uh, that brings a, a bad uh, a dark cloud over over virtual production. Um, so I, I totally agree with what Sam said. Honesty. We need to be clear about how you apply these tools. What are the costs of it? It's not a magic bullet. You're not going to go in and, and and be able to to do what you would have done uh, for two hundred million dollars for twenty million dollars. Like it it doesn't work that way. There is a savings that you can see here, um, but that savings really relies on a full embrace of utilization of these tools and an understanding that there's a big reversal of workflow that needs to happen to apply this correctly. I would even double down on that. I mean, I think Chris is 100% right. I mean, I, you know, one of the things is as far back as I can remember, we were. Um, reticent to take on jobs that maybe other people had started. And even during COVID, we've turned down probably half a dozen jobs, um, particularly in the broadcast segment where they're trying to find avenues to do work that maybe they can't get done any other way. And they're biting off more than they can chew. And people come back to us and go, well, why did you turn down that job? You know, so few people are working right now. And, and A, part of it's, you know, risk mitigation for ourselves. So the other part of it is that you know, we, we've learned over the last decade of doing this, that if we are involved in a project where a producer or a director has a negative experience, they a, probably never come back to us, even if it has nothing to do with us, but they don't touch the technology again for two or three years, like a life cycle on the, on the technology and the, the, the willingness of people to go back and re-engage is, is, is long. And, um, you know, a, a single failed job means that there's a loss for all of us in the industry. I think that's a huge part of it. I agree with both Sam and Chris, it's not a silver bullet by any means. Um, and I, I do think that there's a, but I think it rolls back into the training because the training that needs to get done and everyone needs to be involved. And, and without that, we have unsuccessful projects and we have unsuccessful projects. This whole thing starts to unravel. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to pull Miles into the conversation too, because he mentioned something on our pre-call the other day. Um, and it kind of ties back to what he was saying about people being thrilled about, you know, the, this new puzzle and these new challenges and how some people are going to be a little bit nervous to change. And what you're talking about, Chris, Phil, and Sam is, is, the reason behind some of that nervousness. Um, but I'm curious, uh, Miles, with Epic Games, like connecting creatives and tools and, and training, um, what are ways that we can educate creatives and you know, kind of bring people together around these different concepts? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I want to, I'll just continue to reemphasize is in this space, um, we are bullish. Um, if you start to look at the teams that we have, um, 
I haven't done the math yet, but I'm pretty certain we have hundreds of years of, of uh, uh, filmmaking experience within our ranks. Um, people, you know, who are Academy Award winners, Emmy Award winners, like, like that kind of, which just kind of shows the commitment that we have. Um, in that, as some of you are aware, we um, last year launched a uh, fellowship program. Um, and that was really to kind of bring people together and start to understand and, and share some of the various um, uh, techniques, um, sharing experiences. You know, I think we're it's still in the early phases. So just comparing notes on some of the experiences that people are having is wildly helpful as we start to word, work towards some level of standardization. Um, our intent going forward is really to even start to hone that a little bit more. So I look at the fellowship program, there are a lot of different people that were coming into that. Um, I wanna start to focus a little bit more on, for example, VAD. What do we need to do to like very specifically, what do we need to do to make VAD successful and to increase the, the um, ecosystem there? You know, so we're, we're, let's start to focus in on some of these areas and do this. So in the next year, you know, that that's some of what I want to try to help with. Um, um, and, and the other thing I'll say about the company that I really enjoy is we're kind of production driven. Like when you start, like I said, when you start to look at some of the people, these are people who have been on production and are actually more comfortable in production. So our approach is a little bit different. Our approach is from that context, let me not build tools for tools sake. Let me build them specifically for what the needs are of someone who's in production. And that can be counterintuitive sometimes. Um, you know, just, just because you built this cool thing and you think that it's, you know, the bee's knees, it may be that that impedes something else that is way more important. So that just falls by the wayside. Um, that's, that can be counterintuitive to somebody, but I think from our perspective and how we're going into this, one, we want to make sure that we're making tools that are needed from production, and and we kind of have that, um, uh, we kind of short circuit that so that we're directly interfacing, and then number two, let's help with some of the training and make sure that these tools are usable um, by the people that actually are going to use them. I think you guys have done a, a really great job making VAD more accessible through the Quixel team. I, I really do think that that's yeah. uh, having free access to those photogrammetry assets has been a really big boost, especially early on for lead wall content because it's super expensive to go out and create photorealistic, photogrammetrically created content. Um, and I'm really looking forward to you know having more content produced by them, and also just the adoption of other more traditional VFX uh, post VFX libraries, also offering things in Unreal format optimized for real time and with uh, the material system as well to support that. One thing I just want to say about that, then thank you for saying that. The philosophy of the company that really comes from Tim Sweeney um, is, and 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 that's why the the software itself is open. And you can go into it and make changes if you, you know, if you're a programmer. His the philosophy of the company is let me give you some creative something and not put any sort of barriers to creativity. How can we actually put that in their hands? And then you deal with you know all of the other stuff after creativity has happened. And that is really a unique perspective, I think. Um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that is just if you're excited about Quixel right now, oh boy, you have a good year coming ahead of you. <laughs> Can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so so kind of going from that Quixel Mega Scan um, topic, you know, I, it would be great to talk a little bit about virtual scouting um, and, you know, maybe even explaining to the audience how that and bad setup can be like the chicken before the egg because it's the world you have to build the world before you can visualize the world. So, you know, maybe from ICDR and Halen and Sam's perspective, um, you know, do you end up taking an environment that might look similar to somebody's vision and sharing that with them to do a pre-virtual scout? What's your process? 
Well, I, I think it really depends on what the goal of the scout is. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of different tools that you can bring to bear uh, to try to get to the point where you can visualize an environment. And, you know, some of the things that we've used in the past are just very quickly running cameras through Google Earth to be able to understand what a real world location would look like um, to things that, I mean, Catherine, we were involved in a project last year that was a massive lo location scout and, and photogrammetry shoot. Um, so I think it runs the gamut and, and you're just, you need to, you need to work with the creatives to understand what the goal is, what problem you're trying to solve. And then you bring the tools uh, to solve that problem. And, and, and ideally you don't go any further than you need to. So, um, you know, from, from our standpoint, uh, you know, there, there's a number of ways that, that you can get in very quickly and give the director a way to visualize an environment. Um, and, and this is, I, I will say, probably the number one thing that we get contacted about uh, post-COVID because now people are not able to, to travel to locations that they used to be able to travel to. Um, so it is kind of an ideal situation if you say, rather than sending 10 people to a location, can I take two artists and um, very quickly build out a proxy location uh, to scale that looks very much like that, that location and, and directors can get in and start to lay out their cameras. Awesome. Kind of to add on to that too, I, I really do think it's not a sequential process. It is really important to continue to do that scouting and involve the, the creative team in the building of the, the virtual environment as much as possible. And obviously there needs to be something there at the beginning in order to visualize what you're looking at. If you just have a, a textureless mesh, you know, creative is not going to be able to process that into seeing what a final product could be. Um, but you know, it, it, it should be a, a collaborative process as much as possible. Yeah, I saw a question in the chat about photogrammetry and what that is and how it ties into the beginning of a bad pipeline. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a stab at that. Although, you know, I think Catherine, you, you probably know a lot more about this than, uh, than, than most of us do uh, coming from Gentle Giant. But uh, photogrammetry is where you, you take a number of photographs and put it through a pipeline uh, like uh, say reality capture, which takes a hundred, a thousand photographs from all different angles and assembles it into uh, a 3D object. Uh, and, and what you get out of that is um, a fully textured photorealistic 3D object. And this can be done easily at home at this point with an iPhone, um, or it can be done to uh, you know, a much larger scale where uh, like the project we worked on where we're sending up multiple drones and planes to cover large scale, uh, a large area. Um, it's a very powerful tool and it's a powerful tool that will allow you to either quickly assemble a 3D model all the way to build out something that is completely photorealistic and almost indistinguishable from the real thing. Awesome. Um, but I, I do think it's important, Chris, to talk about um, the fact that you, you have baked in textures and lighting on that model when you do photogrammetry. So if you think you're going to take a, uh, do dramatic changes in lighting and stuff, it's not as uh, pure, if you will, as it is a, a 3D model with the correct, uh, uh, you know, reflective textures and stuff. The, the other yeah, that's, idea. Yeah, that's a great point. That, everything's kind of baked in as wallpaper. So in terms of collaborative editing, um, if you have someone, if, you, if you've done a photogrammetry of a set and you have someone coming in through a door in that set, the door needs to be real 3D, uh, you know, and the set, you know, if you're gonna move the pictures around on the walls, you need to address that. You know, you need to start doing a hybrid of 3D and photogrammetry, depending on how much collaborative editing you're going to decide to do. That's a really good point. There, there's also a de-lighting process, just to, to, to your point, Sam. 
um, a delighting and a relighting process that happens with photogrammetry assets if you are in fact gonna run them real time and you need to change lighting scenarios because of that baked in texture issue. Yeah, Sony's got a thing going with a, a new system down in Culver City that is based in photogrammetry that's pretty impressive uh, on their CLED screens. So that's something worth checking out, you know, but photogrammetry is, as you say, a, a fabulous way to make a, a quick model that is really, that really looks good. You just have to live with the light. I can see that our next panel is coming up soon, but I just wanted to um, celebrate this panel and just do one more group question. Um, just, uh, I guess the question would be, what would be your key insight for um, how our community can achieve um, like some of the goals that we talked about in this conversation for 2021? Miles? Um, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's he's in charge of all this stuff. I mean, Epic's driving everything, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I'd rather hear from you guys, but 2021 is going to be pretty exciting, I have to say. Okay. I mean, there's a, I, I think everybody has caught a little bit of a glimpse, um, but, uh, you know, um, I, I'm, I count myself as fortunate as working with a great group of amazing, amazing developers that, that really listen. Um, to what we've heard over the last year um, and are working very, very hard and very, very diligently um, at coming up with solutions um, that are really going to streamline. You know, I, I mean, for me, I, I, I just go back to <laughs> when we used to wait for things to render and just now what is coming down the pipe and not having to wait where you're actually seeing it immediately, it just unlocks so many different things. So. Um, I guess, you know, 2021 is further unlocking of those things. Yeah, I, I'm going to second that. I'm really excited for UE5. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited for a time when um, this technology and this workflow is a little bit more understood because I think that there is a lot of potential to unlock the ability for creatives to tell stories that they would have been locked off from telling previously uh, due to budget constraints or you know, due to the situation we're in right now where no one can, can travel and people can't gather and, and Phil's got to you know, wear PPE to a, to a panel. Um, you, you know, the, the, there, is, there is a future where you as a creative can step on stage and say, you know, I, I want, I want to see Sao Paulo in the background. Um, you, you'll be able to, to very quickly assemble um, any location in the world. And, and that will unlock, I think, a, um, a really exciting era in filmmaking. Yeah, now we just have to have the, the writers and the producers catch up to where we know what's possible, right? I, I mean, I think you're, we have the tools to achieve just about anything, uh, given uh, the proper amount of time and, and creative vision and coordination on it. It's not always about the money. I mean, one of the things that, that these tools are doing is they're radically reducing the cost of creating Sao Paulo, you know, uh, or, or replacing these. And, and I think what I'm looking forward to is the jump into cameras that can see in 3D depth for real, right? Uh, because then you can change all sorts of things and you, and you won't, and it won't be dependent on, do you have a, enough money to buy an LED screen and how big is it because you're shooting off it, right? I mean, that's a very limiting factor on this thing is, you know, if you don't have a million bucks in your pocket, you can only get to 30 feet, right? You, you know, so, you know, I think it's gonna circle back again. I think, you know, chroma matting is a very um, uh, primitive way to pull a mat. And once we have full depth integration from the primary lens and we understand it, then we can change any of our backgrounds without having something like this green screen back here. And then, Okay, if you got an LED, great. If you want to do a depth map, great. But you, you know, you see in Z depth, uh, and and in my estimation, all 
almost all of 20, 21st century art is, is flat. I mean, what we're looking at right here is flat as a pancake, right? I want to see, I want the capture device to go 3D and then everything that comes away from that. And then we'll have the tools to make all those great things like UE5 really come to life because the the combination of the elements, it's the mix is the problem right now. I mean, UE4 is creating the elements, it's the mix. And until it gets to be as fluid as a, as a sound mix, where you can just pick a sound and it's generated or sampled or whatever it is, but you just mix it in invisibly and you've got 55 different elements running in real time in a sound mix. Um, when we can have, truly have visual mixing in real time, uh, that'll be, uh, that's what I'm waiting for. I know that certainly on my end, I would actually second what Chris said. I think we're getting to a place where people can tell the stories they want to tell. I think ultimately we're all here because we like organically telling stories collaboratively with other people and doing it in situ and getting that gratification of making decisions and seeing the end result and, and being part of a narrative that isn't something that we lose sight of once we step off set. Um, I'm really excited to see the maturation of these tools and, and the development of these tools and help storytellers tell stories that they've not been able to tell before and tell them in new and exciting ways. Yeah, likewise. I mean, I, I don't have, have too much to add to all that, but I, I do think the key that a lot of people have mentioned is just accessibility and education. And I think that just keeps need, needs to be driven home over the next year and, you know, doing panels like this and, and spreading knowledge about what can be done and how to do it as easily as possible. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, this has been a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you, what, what a wonderful Thanks, group of people here today. You, know, <laughs> you, you guys, guys are, are all about, such yeah. pioneers that are really making a difference. Um, so we really appreciate that. So. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Guys. Yep. Take care. Yeah, so, a few things that I might highlight in this panel is, um, again, this isn't a silver bullet. Um, if you think that you're just going to be able to walk on a stage, project something that you created, not quite that easy. There's a, a bit of complexity there um, that even matching the color between what's coming off the screen and um, your physical uh, set there in front. And I guess